Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Dialogue. Good evening. My name's Garland Nixon, and uh, you are listening to Dialogue on 89.3 WPFW-FM here every Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. I'm lucky enough to have, fortunate enough to have with me Delegate Roger Mano from the 19th District in Maryland. We're going to talk about health care. You know, it's almost, we, we've almost created a caste system in this country where we have, you know, folks who can afford health care and live longer and live healthier and happier and folks who can't. And if you believe <laughs> that America is the land of opportunity, not just opportunity that you create, but the opportunity that we as a nation create and believe in, then you have to arrive at the conclusion that health care, because of the complexities of it and the expenses of it, health care needs to be fixed. People have a right to expect the government which does some things very well, <laughs> levels playing fields, does something about this problem. Who has the most to lose in comprehensive health care reform? It's the industrial health care complex that exists in this country today, the pharmaceutical companies, the health insurance companies, uh, the middlemen that take a little piece at every layer of the health care system. I think if we talk about the principles of health care reform, people naturally arrive at a pretty good conclusion. People that don't have an economic interest in making a lot of money off sick people arrive at the conclusion that something's got to change. You look at the fact that health care premiums are outpacing wages three, four, five times to one. You look at the fact that the number one cause of bankruptcies in this country is medical debt. You look at the fact that we're not doing nearly enough in terms of uh, providing preventative care, uh, mammograms, for example, to make sure that people don't get sick to begin with. If you did that, and if all health insurance companies were required to cover those as they would under the president's plan, it would save a lot of money, and it would save Absolutely. a lot of lives. You know, the cost of doing this thing has been blown out of proportion. The question we should be asking as moral people is what is the cost of not doing it, not just the economic cost, which is staggering, but the human cost, the cost in human lives. What do those 47 million people do when they only go to the hospital, into the emergency room, when they're sick? And that is the least effective, most expensive form of health care out there. And who pays for it? We do in the form of higher premiums. The, the system is broken from, it, it's upside down. You mentioned before um, the state of Maryland, the state health insurance plan, which is really a high risk pool, right. the state high risk pool. You know, I'm glad that we have that. Many states don't have that. Right. But it, it is also upside down. I'll tell you why. Because... States can determine what group of people health insurance companies have to cover. Right. What that is is the high risk pool. It allows for the insurance companies to eliminate the high risk mm -hmm. folks from the insurance pool and to, to only insure relatively low or medium risk people. It makes it really... Th so that, they win again. <laughs> insurance is, the, is, is not the elimination of risk. It's the management of risk. And right. how do you do that effectively? You spread the few high-risk people over a large pool right. of medium to low-risk people, not eliminate them completely. There is nobody protesting the money that we spend on bombs and bombers and things of that nature. It is insulting to me that with the amount of money we spend for death, that people can't accept the fact that we need to spend at least as much to keep people alive. We spend $2.2 trillion a year on health care in this country. You know, we, could, we can implement you know, medical records fixes, I mean, you know, administrative fixes. If we got rid of the administrative bureaucracies that exist in health care systems in this country today, we could pay for health care for everybody. Mike, line two. <laughs> Hello, Garland, and uh, thanks, Delegate Mano, for this great discussion. Thanks, you know, Mike. I believe health care uh, should be a right in a civilized country, and I wish I had access to affordable health care. Delegate Mano, how to deal with the very simplistic uh, messages that those who, who are opposing it? You know, you're, there's going to be death panels, your grandmother's going to be killed, etc. Do you say these people are lying, or do you just say, well, he, here are the facts? How do you see it? Well, you have to respond to the accusations, and, you know, this is a policy debate. It's also a, a debate about principles. The notion that there will be some absurd death panels, I mean, that's simply not true. The notion that undocumented immigrants 
are covered under the president's plan. That's not true either. If you have your own doctor and you want your doctor, you'll be able to keep your doctor. Another one that's out there uh, relates to abortion funding. There are no changes under this bill from current law with respect to public funding of abortions. This bill allows for Americans to choose a doctor. It allows for Americans to be guaranteed some health care coverage. It will reduce substantially the economic burden on families and on this country. This stuff is dragging this country down. It's dragging American families down. It is so center to the economic crisis that we're in right now, and, and, and not only in this country, but our standing in the world. It's sucking the air out of the room, Healthcare is, in terms of the, the universe of dollars available for other things. I would advise folks to, to stay involved, to get involved, to, to call their representatives in Rockville and D.C. and Annapolis on Capitol Hill, uh, and tell them what you want. Tell them, tell them the principles of what you want. You demand that health care be dealt with legally as a right or morally as a right, that, that folks be covered, that health insurance companies cannot discriminate against individuals because of a pre-existing condition or some kind of a genetic trait. Uh, there, are, there are basic principles at play here. You know, and once folks start to think about those principles, they, I think most people of conscience naturally arrive at a conclusion that we need to do something about the system because it's fundamentally broken. You know, health care reform is the, and, and the health care system in this country and, in, and among the various states is the greatest domestic crisis that this country faces. Right. And there's no politician in this country that, that, that believes otherwise. <laughs> I think we all get it. And, and more importantly, the people that we work for get it. And they sent many of us down here to solve problems, to improve people's lives, to make government work again. And the notion that folks would be more concerned with holding on to their seats, you know, career politicians, I think is an affront to what we're supposed to be doing down here. This is the moral issue of our generation. This is the domestic crisis of our generation. And we have a responsibility, not just elected officials, but all of us, to get up and do something about this thing. The moment is now. I mentioned to you before we started broadcasting that I've never felt more like this was a pivotal point in history and that history was almost looking back at us and saying, what did these guys do? I don't want to be uh, a collaborator right. to the, the wrong side of this issue. Elected officials and community leaders who were put in office or, or hold a public trust and who were sent there to to bring back health care. When I, when I ran for the General Assembly, Congressman Conyers said, go to Annapolis and bring back health care. <laughs> was sent there to bring back health care. Our soldiers in this war for health care. And there may be casualties in that war, but it has to be done. It's what is necessary to move this country forward. It's what's necessary to maintain what's beautiful and great about this country. The, the hope and promise that everybody can attain their, their highest potential. They can't do that right now. Millions, tens of millions of Americans can't do that right now with this burden of health care uh, um, you know, hanging on them. And uh, you know, the soldiers, the elected officials, the, 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 the warriors in the legislatures need to bring that message with them every time they go to battle. One of the um, things that was put forward is, was to just go ahead and put everyone in under um, um, under Medicare. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Delegate Mano? I'd love to see that. I mean, the greatest health care system in this country that we've ever seen, the one that works the best, the most efficient, is Medicare. Or, or to let everybody buy into the same health insurance right. plan that you have or members of Congress have, but I'm not sure if the politics are quite there yet. What can people do to make a difference? I think people should think about the principles of health care reform. Do they want choice in a doctor? Do they want to reduce bankruptcies that exist uh, because of medical debt? Do they want to invest in preventative and wellness care? Do they want to invest in patient safety and quality? All these, these sort of talking points, but they're principles. And to think about that, if the answer to those questions is yes, then you inevitably arrive at the conclusion that we need to do something. And when you get there, call your members of Congress, call your state legislators, your elected officials, and your community leaders, and tell them that I want health reform now. Be part of this solution. Uh, be part of this moment in history. Uh, and I think that um, I think we're going to get there.